Thank you, Well, uh, I, I first wanted to thank uh, the Global Justice Center. Uh, they're really doing something truly exciting in this campus, providing a forum for more than six or seven departments to get together and talk about not football, we don't have a good football team to talk about, or politics, but really what can we do about climate change? And uh, so I'm, you know, the last uh, two, three months has taken me travels uh, across from Harvard to Imperial College, London School of Economics, and Notre Dame, day before yesterday on climate justice. I'm, without any exaggeration, nowhere have I seen this mix of natural social scientists and policy wonks getting together. I mean, it's just amazing thing that's happening in the campus. I see some students here join the team. You're not going to get this anywhere. On the issue of uh, short-lived climate pollutants, I mean, an excellent example of what I'm saying is we have an MD talking about short-lived climate pollutants. So I was just so excited to hear Will talk about that. In recognition of all the things Wayne said, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, has formed this uh, you know, climate and clean air coalition, you say, to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. And now over 25 uh, uh, nations have joined. And I'm working with the World Bank. And apparently, they are planning to spend about $5 billion on this starting from next year. So this is uh, about to uh, take off. Uh, and the first thing is why, you know, when we hear about climate change, we only he hear about carbon dioxide. Why suddenly these other pollutants? So if you look at the curve, this paper is going to be published uh, this Sunday. The red one is business as usual, which is the path we are on. David convinced us of that. So what it shows is by 2050, we're going to shoot past two degrees, the so-called dangerous threshold. I am focusing on that near term. I think that goes directly into the climate justice issue, which is, you know, Mary Robinson talked about it. Uh, I now think of the world as two worlds. One is the four billion who are accessing fossil fuel. The other world is three billion who have no access to fossil fuel. In the two degree world, the other three billion would suffer unbelievably, uh, things I've just experienced you know, living in villages, how they would suffer a two degree warming. And four degree warming, World Bank already de declared we a disaster. So the blue curve is, what if, if the world listened to David Victors of the world and cut down CO2? The only thing we can do now is to level CO2 at 440 ppm. It's close to 400 today. And you see that all it will help is go from four to three. All of this have a probability distribution. This is a 50% probability. But if we cut short-lived climate pollutants, the beauty of them is that we have technologies. I hope I'll convince you by the end of it. You get another 50% so that when you do them together, you follow the green line. The main message I want to convey to you is we are not going to be able to do it with CO2 alone. We have lost that luxury. Had we done when the Montreal, you know, the, the Kyoto Protocol, then we could have done it with CO2, not anymore. And this is at least my work, and I feel uh, pretty reasonably confident in making that statement. So, so we need both. And what are the sources of this? The diesel is one of the major source. That was the, I was on that second auto rickshaw, and my wife was behind and taking that picture. And uh, so this is, of course, diesel truck. We know what black carbon is. It's one of the major short-lived climate pollutants. 60% of the black carbon, the second largest contributor to global warming, is amenable to control. But you don't have to take my word for it. So this is a report which is, was released. It was a joint study led by my group, but over four universities were involved. We showed black carbon in California has come down by 50% just from diesel control. So much so we estimated California has mitigated equal to 20 million tons of CO2 per year just from the black carbon, okay? 
So this was released, and they're going to take a major news release next week on this. So that's one of the other sorts of black carbon is some of the pictures I took in the villages, biomass burning, crop burning. And you can see we have the first evidence for what we call brown carbon. That is black carbon, that is brown carbon, and that is white carbon, which cools. Okay. So the other one is trash burning. I think this is something from the West, we have imported so much of our technology, we did not export how to get rid of garbage. So it's, I think of it as one of the biggest disasters coming around, and you can see how much black carbon is put from that. So now to talk in the cook stove issue, as Whale told us, about three billion have no access to fossil fuels. And that I picked, took a picture of her in the, this is the village in the Himalayas, and I told her, tried to give her a five-minute lecture on brown clouds. She said, no, sir, all the black carbon is just on my wall. So I took her outside. I made her take that picture. She was shocked. Then I told her, do you know what happens to this? I showed her the satellite image. It sort of fills the whole because there are 600 million homes burning this. It was numerous. Uh, Jen is going to talk about some of this. I'm going to skip over this. So at UCSD, we started this project, Surya, teaming up with a major NGO, Teddy, and then Nextleaf Analytics. That's an NGO run by my daughter. It's basically cell phone technologies. Now numerous institutions have joined us. I just want to walk through one of the study. We've done many studies. So we showed how with that force draft stuff, you can bring down black carbon emissions by 70%. By the way, how did California cut its black carbon emission? Changing the fuel mix, low sulfur diesel, and a filter. For a Mercedes car, the filter is about $700. So it's barely 1% of the cost. For a huge truck, it's about 5000 5, so it's on the order of 1% to 5% increase of the cost. So now we have the technology. It's still not perfect, not perfectly user-friendly, but it works. The question is, how do we scale it up? OK, it's worth $70, worth five months of a paycheck of a village person. And we think we can bring it to 50. But what we are now exploring is something unique getting, converting the reduction in CO2 and black carbon to carbon credits, that's not a new idea, but giving it to the woman directly. So how do you make that happen? So we also solar lamps because there's no electricity. One thing I want to mention, David, is, as he said, there are wires, but the electricity comes only four hours of a day. And they don't tell them which four hours. Just imagine. How do you plan your life? You don't know when you're going to get your electricity. Four hours is not a problem. They don't tell them when. It's random. Anyway, so the key thing in all this is how do you know they're complying? So this is where Nitya has come up with the temperature sensor. We're going to put the sensor in every stop. The data would come to scripts. We would convert the equivalent black carbon reductions and send the money back to her. Well, that's the start. How do you make this happen? You need to find distributors. So we have started this what's called energy entrepreneurs. I helped, uh, you know, in the opening ceremony, there was a mob scene. About 1,500 showed up. So I personally think the issues, of course, we, we need to person change technologies, but they are ready. I think my own, I'm a physical scientist. The reason they are ready they have seen through TV, like David said, electricity is for watching TV. They know there is a different, better life out there. And that life doesn't involve black walls. Okay? So we have now started 51 of these energy entrepreneurs. That state we are working with, its population is 200 million. Just imagine. Okay? It's one of the densest polluted states. The thing is, how do, can this woman buy it? So now we have just signed on a major agreement. This happened four, five days ago. He's the chairman, CEO, of a rural bank, Operating Government of India. You see that cloth wrapped around me? When he gives that cloth, it means he has sealed a deal with you. 
So, uh, so I told him, can I take a proof that I showed the government? He said, sure. So he let me take a picture of it. And so we just signed the paperwork with him. The beauty of this, unlike the Grameen Bank, which charges you 25 outrageous interest rate, he's going to give the interest at 10%. So the last thing is, how do we make this happen? We have formed village oversight committee. They are all leaders of 10 villages we're going to work with. So we're going to form these clusters. And finally, I'm explaining the science of global warming to Mrs. Bono. And Jerry would be happy to hear that. I asked this lady, she's been using it. How do you know this villagers would buy? She said, don't worry, sir. There are five of us here, influential women. When we switch, the whole cluster of villages would switch. Changing the social norm, I thought was a theory. She outlined beautifully. And so she's going to work with us. She's going to be in the village oversight committee. And how do you get this go global? We have now signed on an agreement with two voluntary carbon registries. So they are going to send their auditors to our villages. This is going to start about uh, four weeks from now with 2,000 villages. And, and University of California has started a climate mitigation fund. We are going for crowdsourcing. We have about $45,000. So that'll fund about 2,000 stars, carbon credits. I think, so this UCSD team, we are theorists, we are modelers, we are experimentalists, but we also believe in taking this to the field. And, and to conclude, Jerry Mackey is leading an effort across six or seven departments to scale this up.